Thank you very much. It's a true pleasure uh, to speak here on mathematics and finance. So I'm on the mathematical end of this uh, broad uh, interdisciplinary endeavor here. And well, my talk, of course, will again be uh, quite different from the, from the previous talks. Where's Yitzhak Gilboa? Uh, ah, hi. <laughs> So uh, it will be different because I will not uh, uh, speak on a paper of mine or a book of mine. Uh, I, I have decided to give a rather non-technical talk, and uh, which wants to elaborate what uh, was the influence of mathematics on finance. Uh, what did it good? Did it possibly do some harm? But also in the other, the other way around a little bit, uh, how did finance influence uh, mathematics? And uh, well, so how can we elaborate on these things? And after some uh, considerations, I came to the conclusion, it's a good idea to have a close look how models were developed, in which context, because uh, as we shall see, people had very precise uh, questions uh, to answer, and if they provided good answers, then maybe these models became successful and were applied possibly to similar situations, but possibly also to quite different situations, uh, uh, which happened here. Sometimes to the good, sometimes to the not so good. And in order to get a better understanding of this, I decided to have a somewhat historic look back how things developed in, uh, in mathematical finance. So the first part will be of a more historic uh, nature where I have a close look how things developed. And then in the second part, I will come to more recent uh, developments, where I also will touch to uh, some of my papers, and I will try to draw some conclusions on the uh, financial reality. So let us start with our hero, Louis Bachelier, who in 1900 defended his thesis in Paris with a beautiful title, Théorie de la Spéculation. So at this time, things were still named by their proper names. And yeah, and uh, he's an interesting character. He was already 30 years old when he defended uh, his thesis. Uh, he never went to, to one of the elite schools in, in France. He was an outsider to the system. He was poor. He was working as a kind of secretary at the uh, Bourse de Paris, so at the stock exchange. And you can feel from every line of his uh, thesis that he was fascinated by this, uh, what's happening on the stock exchange. My personal theory, but this is speculation, is this guy was a gambler. The, uh, because, I mean, he, was, he came from a quite well-off family of wine merchants in Le Havre. When his uh, parents passed away at the age of 19, he took over the company, and then nothing is known. And a few years later, he's at the stock exchange in Paris, and he's poor. What happened? Uh, and OK, but maybe there are some more professional historians who can turn this speculation into some more solid knowledge. Little is known about him. That's the only photo, apparently, uh, where you see him as a young guy. So what did he want to do? Uh, he was fascinated in particular by the option trading, and he wanted to have a rational theory of option pricing. And to understand his approach, uh, it is important to have a closer look at the concrete situation which he faced there. So there was heavy trading, and, and in particular, there was one very interesting asset, the so-called rounds, uh, round. Uh, so these are perpetual bonds. As I have generously one hour and I wanted to do a little history, I can tell the story which goes back to the French Revolution. And uh, after the, many of the noblemen emigrated, and when they came back in the restoration, they wanted to have the property back. 
But after 25 years of uh, revolution, Napoleon, etc., this was difficult. And so the government of uh, Louis XVIII, uh, they had this wonderful idea. They gave them perpetual bonds, which would pay a, a quarterly interest, and, but the capital was never paid. And these, during the whole 19th century, they were passed on in the families. They provided them with an, uh, with an appropriate income. And there was heavy trading in this. And also there was uh, futures trading in this, which was, in fact, a typical trading. And there were, uh, there were uh, options on these things, which came up in a natural way also. Uh, OK, I should not elaborate too much, but uh, the, these uh, uh, rent, these perpetual bonds, they had a nominal value of 100 louis d'or, and they paid 3% interest per year in quarterly coupons of 75 centimes. And, uh, uh, but of course, they were traded not always at the, at the price of 100, but it would go up and down. But it would typically not deviate too much from its nominal value. There would be a low volatility, and the options he considered, they were very short-living options, typically two, three weeks, something uh, in this order of magnitude. It was just that it was a futures contract, and you combined it with a kind of, uh, with, with a kind of uh, insurance. So instead of doing the forward contract, you could also uh, pay a somewhat higher price but en revanche, uh, you were, when prices went down, your risk was limited to 5 centimes, 10 centimes, or 20 centimes. They, the prices of the options, they were standardized, and the strike price would uh, vary. And they resulted in approximately at the money options. OK, so this was his situation. And what does he do? Well. This picture, I think everybody in this room knows it. This is the payoff function of such a call option. This appears in, in his thesis exactly as it, well, with different letters, but otherwise it's exactly the same thing. I don't elaborate on that. And, okay, yeah. Now, here comes the first big step. I mean, his approach is probabilistic. I mean, we are so used to this, but I want to give a, uh, a reconsideration, how does come probability here uh, into, into the game? Because after all, no, no coins are tossed at the, at the stock market. And he elaborates in a very nice way on this. Let me quote from his thesis. He distinguishes two kinds of probabilities. Let me start with the second one. The, the second one is what we have just seen as the the personal, uh, or you call it personal probabilities, or uh, individual probabilities, the H in your every, huh? Yeah. yeah, subjective, okay, subjective, yeah. I mean, in, in fact, uh, he even uses almost the same words. This probability, it's dependent on future events, as he puts it, consequently impossible to predict in a mathematical manner, this last is the probability that the speculator tries to predict. And he contrasts this with a probability which might be called mathematical, which can be determined a priori and which is studied in games of chance. It's a little bit uh, mystical, this passage, in contrast to the rest of the thesis. But in hindsight, and with some goodwill, you can see here the personal probabilities, uh, and here the risk-neutral probability or the pricing probability as we call it today. And <clears throat> yeah, and here he even uses the word personal. The, the second one, <clears throat> the inductions of the speculators are absolutely personal since his counterpart in the transaction necessarily has the opposite opinion. Okay, and now we come to the uh, beautiful passage which we call today the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, and what Bachelier says, it seems that the market, the aggregate of speculators, at a given instance can believe in neither a market rise nor a market fall, since at each quoted price there are as many buyers as sellers. We are in 1900 here. Uh, 
And now comes the culmination of the whole, whole thing. L'espérance mathématique du spéculateur est nulle. Uh, so the mathematical expectation of the speculator is zero. And, uh, well, the reason is exactly this paragraph. And he says, the consideration of true prices. By true prices, he means properly discounted prices, where he also corrects for coupon payments, etc. So all this, he does perfectly right. And it's easy for him to do the right uh, uh, discounting, because they were doing things in forward terms anyhow. The, also, the, the, the premium for the, uh, for the option was only paid at exercise. So there was no problem here. He does everything perfectly well. And he says, the consideration of true prices permits the statement of this fundamental principle, the mathematical expectation of the speculator is zero. OK. So, and if you admire it already, your admiration will grow with the next paragraph. Uh, at least if you appreciate the mathematics here. Uh, let, me, let me start with the example. For example, I buy a bond uh, with the intention, so the bonds are here, the risky assets. Uh, the, uh, I buy a bond with the intention of selling it when it will have appreciated by 50 centimes. The expectation of this complex transaction is zero, exactly as if I intended to sell my bond on the liquidation date or at any time, whatever. So whatever you do, in average, you neither lose nor gain. And in this paragraph, there is so much mathematics in, in Nutze uh, that, first of all, this time when it ha will have appreciated by 50 centimes, this is the perfect example of a stopping time. And when you stop a martingale, the optional sampling theorem of Joe Dupe tells us it doesn't matter, expectation is always zero. So, uh, yeah, you have, in a way, you have the <coughs> idea of a martingale here, and in the first uh, in the first paragraph, which I do not read, uh, is he just describes whatever you do the operations which we today say trading on a martingale, uh, you just don't change the the expectation which always remains zero. Okay, so <clears throat> now the next thing is the model which Bachelier chooses and how he reasons for it. I think most people know with which he has uh, ended up. Well, first of all, uh, he speaks about this transition probability. So the notation is, uh, if we go <coughs> from today, we go by t into the future, so say in one month, and today the stock price is x, then we want to know what is the uh, uh, distribution of the stock price in, what did I say, one month from now. And these transition probabilities, well, they should be homogeneous in time, which means between now and in a month should be the same from in a week to in a month plus a week. And should be homogeneous in time, uh, also in space. So whether his rent is at 100 or at 101, it should not matter. Uh, okay. And if he does these two things, he immediately comes up, because he knew the central limit theorem, he immediately comes up what we call today the Brownian motion <coughs> in the usual additive sense. Well, I put here, it's the unique solution. He was not elaborating on uniqueness, and I mean, the mathematics were in a different style than today. Also, it's only the unique so solution for the mathematicians uh, with finite variance. Otherwise, you also have this alpha stable processes, etc. But that's not what is of interest here. He gets the solution. Uh, he analyzes it very well. He makes the connection with the heat equation, which is also a wonderful thing, etc. And he has, of course, this crucial uh, parameter sigma here, which today we call the volatility, and which he, of course, called much, much nicer, the coefficient of nervousness of the market, much more beautiful than volatility. But things develop their way. 
So, our pride is, of course, that Bachelier was five years earlier than Einstein and independently Smoluchowski in physics. And as you all know, it's called after this botanist Brown, who in 1826 or 27 looked into a microscope and there were these particles and had this uh, 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 erratic movement. But I was very happy at some stage when somebody pointed out to me that this is already much older. And yeah, there, there are also observations in the 18th century, but much, much older. And here, I cannot refrain from giving you this beauty here. Lucrez, uh, from 99 to 55 before Christ. So he was a contemporary of Cicero, and he wrote De Dererum uh, natura, so about the nature of things, with five books. Uh, so this is from the second book. So he was in this Epicurean uh, uh, philosophy of atomistic uh, reasoning. And, and of course, his arguments are in beautiful Latin in hexameters. Hoc etiam magis hec animum te advertere pares. Well, I don't go on. Uh, the, here is the English translation for those who are not so <laughs> fluent in... Uh, uh, okay, so he describes a situation which does not correspond, no, not quite correspond to this room here. You are in a completely dark room, but outside there is very bright sun, and there is some sunbeam coming in, and what happens? Uh, observe what happens when sunbeams are admitted into a building and shed light on its shadowy places. You will see a multitude of tiny particles mingling in a multitude of ways. Their dancing is an actual indication of underlying movements of matter that are hidden from our sight. It ori originates with the atoms, and atoms, it's interesting because the, the Latin word for atoms is principia. So at the same time, it's the original things, and it's the atoms in this Epicurean theory. It originates with the atoms, which move of themselves. Then those small compound bodies that are least removed from the impetus of the atoms are set in motion by the impact of their invisible blows and in turn cannon against slightly larger bodies. So the movement mounts up from atoms and gradually emerges to the level of our senses so that those bodies in motion that we see in sunbeams are moved by blows that remain invisible. This is really, I mean, uh, of course it corresponds exactly to what, what Einstein and company did 2,000 years later. Um, okay, so this is uh, the background for Brownian motion. Okay, now he has fixed the model. And he's already in perfectly good shape because his recipe is you price everything by expectation, period. The by, as an immediate consequence from this fundamental principle, the mathematical expectation of the speculator is zero. You just have to take expectations. And here it's really easy. It's easier even than in the usual Black-Scholes analysis, which we have to do for our students. Uh, so, for example, what you have to do, you have a Gaussian distribution and you have to integrate such a function, which is really elementary. And I just picked you a couple of nice results, which is not, uh, yeah, the interesting thing, he did not end up with a formula, although you can easily do the formula, uh, because our usual way is we fix the strike price and we calculate uh, the, the premium. For them, it was the other way around. And apparently, there is no, no closed form how to write uh, the, 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 uh, the formula in the, in the other direction. But he gives very good recipes how you have to calculate, etc., etc. And he has beauties. So an add-the-money call option, add-the-money means that the strike price is exactly the actual price, or to be precise, the forward price. Okay, for an add-the-money call option, one pertains a very nice form, so it's proportional 
to sigma, to this volatility in the additive sense of uh, Bachelier. It is proportional to the square root of the time to maturity. And for mathematicians, of course, particularly nice pi comes up. And uh, OK, and uh, another beauty, which is not matched in the, uh, in the Black-Scholes formula, of course, asymptotically, uh, these things also hold true for the, for the Black-Scholes formula if you do the linearization. But not in this. Huh? What is T? T is the time to expiration. So you have. So a, as I told, it was maximum two months at uh, at his time. So he was wondering, what is the probability to make a net gain when buying an at the money option? Because I mean, you have to pay the premium, and your payoff should be at least. Uh, the, what you have paid for the premium, and it's, it's easy to see, you just have to plug in this into the density of the normal distribution, but this with the segment square root of t, but also the normal distribution has to be properly renormalized, and if you do a very easy calculation, the segment the square root of t cancels out, and what you get is a quantity which does not depend on sigma or t, it's something, and this is, this is about probability is one-third. So you have a probability of one-third of making a gain. You have a probability of two-thirds of losing. But this, of course, does not contradict the, the uh, fundamental principle because the losses are bounded and the, the uh, gains can be high. And this is reflected by these things. But of course, these are beautiful formulas, etc. OK. So, I, maybe I should not overdo it. Uh, yeah, next step. There comes up the notion of arbitrage, and we know, and this, this will be my next step, how is arbitrage and probability uh, related. And arbitrage comes up in Bachelier's thesis, I mean, not under this name, and of, as, again, he, he just writes it very nicely. These are, for him, these are operations in which one of the traders would profit regardless of eventual prices. Perfect definition of arbitrage, okay? And what he, what he, can, he, he mentions, we will see that such spreads are never found in practice. No arbitrage principle and just common sense. Okay, not a big deal for him. He used it for several things, so for example, when you have the option prices that this is a convex function or something like this, he proved with uh, these arguments. But otherwise, the, the basic relation uh, between probability theory on one hand and no arbitrage on the other, there he had no, well, he did not do, and in my opinion, he did already so much, and, but to do such a thing, he would have had to make quite a number of additional steps in his lonely endeavor. Okay, so, but back to the, back to the basic thing. How comes probability into the game here? And uh, there, it's, there it's nice to have again a look at his thesis, where at the end of, the, of his thesis, he does some empirical work. He looks at actual option prices. Of course, he also uh, determines what we call today implicit volatility, that he looks to which volatility or nervousness of the market uh, the observed prices uh, correspond and how they are consistent among them. And, and then he writes in a somewhat pompous way, uh, if with respect to several questions treated in the study, I've compared the results of observation with those of theory. It was not to verify formula established by mathematical methods, but only to show that the market unwittingly obeys a law which governs it, the law of probability. Okay. Uh, so, uh, his thesis was, uh, he was an outsider, he just gave in his thesis, but they made a jury consisting of three persons, and one of them was Henri Poincaré. And Henri Poincaré had a very close look. Apparently, this, he had nothing to do before this, but he understood immediately, perfectly, what this guy was doing, and wrote a very positive and insightful uh, report. But 
I just quote uh, this passage where he does this, and he's less enthusiastic. Uh, so Poincaré, one should not expect a very exact verification. The principle of the mathematical expectation holds in the sense that if it were violated, there would always be people who would act so as to re-establish it, and they would eventually notice this. But they would only notice it if the deviations were considerable. The verification then can only be gross. So if this holds an expectation, it should only be, uh, be noticed when the deviations are gross uh, that there is something wrong. Okay, the, auth the author of the thesis gives statistics where this happens in a very satisfactory manner. So, but this is not the only passage. I mean, he altogether wrote a very positive report. It was the only report, but still, he, he, Poincaré was not forgiven that he was an outsider of the system. He got a mention honorable, and this 100 years ago, exactly as today, means thank you very much, goodbye. Nah. Uh, and uh, because in the French system you need a mention très honorable to, in order to make an academic career. So he had a hard time, and only after World War I, when so many mathematicians had died, uh, he got a chance in Besançon to, uh, to get a professorship. Uh, but altogether it was a, a not so uh, lucky life. Uh, well, let me go on with the with the question uh, whether it is reasonable to use probability, well, as it was called in the, at the time, uh, in the science morale. Today we would say the social sciences. And Poincaré wrote a very interesting book, Science et Méthode, in some years later, where he dedicates a whole chapter to chance and probability. And, uh, one of the reasons, yeah, I should uh, tell a little bit what he does there. So, he elaborates on, on what do we call chance, and it is very much in this uh, spirit of dynamical systems. Uh, he says that uh, uh, the obvious example being flipping a coin or shuffling cards or something like this, the situation must be a dynamical system for him where uh, the whole situation is complex, where uh, little changes in the initial conditions may have large effects on the outcome. Uh, and, uh, well, what else? Yeah, we will see it in a moment. <clears throat> but I mean, this kind of reasoning. And then he asks, can this be translated to social sciences. And then, after some reasoning, he has a very clear statement, the laws of chance do not apply to these questions. And one of the reasons, this is perhaps unfortunate, since if it did, Condorcet's method would protect us against miscarriages. Uh, one word about this Condorcet, who was a, a marquis, but he was an active revolutionary in the French Revolution. And he was, he was uh, already studying voting behavior, etc. So he was the first who observed that when you, when you have the choice of three people or more, that A can be preferred to B. Yeah, you'd all, I mean, this was the beginning of the way to Arrow's uh, impossibility theorem. And among other things, he also elaborated on how big a jury should be in order to have a good chance to get a, a, a good result. He did an extremely simple model. I mean, each judge has a probability P to do the right thing, and this should be bigger than one half. And then he concludes the more judges, the more likely uh, is that the uh, corresponding, uh, uh, that the good result comes out. And this is what uh, Poincaré is referring to. Uh, that uh, it's unfortunate, but it simply, it, it doesn't work for this, as uh, Poincaré argues. And here, here is, is his argument, and this is so beautiful. <clears throat> we attempted to attribute facts of this nature, and where he says the applications in science morale. And remember, eight years earlier, he wrote the report on uh, Bachelier's thesis. Of this nature, to chance, 
because their causes are obscure. This was one of the things which he said, this is how chance, the causes are pure. But this is not true chance. The causes are unknown to us, it is true, and they, they are even complex. These were constituents for him where we can operate with chance. But they are not sufficiently complex since they preserve something. Okay, this was his argument before. There should be nothing preserved in this. This was in this thinking we have uh, of, of Boltzmann with the, with the ergodic conjecture, that there should be sufficient mixing. This was the, the, the idea at this time. He, he gives examples where in card shuffling, so he does simplified card shuffling, you just exchange the position of two cards whenever uh, a coin comes up uh, with head, say, and he says, of course, uh, very quickly, nothing is preserved of the original structure. And uh, then he says, you can also do it with a biased coin, no problem. Okay, same thing, after some time, you will have lost all the structure. But if the coin is such that it always falls on head, then it's different. Then there is, the situation is too simple, something is preserved. And this is what he says here, when it comes to a uh, human being, something is preserved. And then there comes a very poetic passage, which is often quoted. We have seen, uh, yeah, first of all, that the, the preservation, this is something, is a distinguishing mark of two simple causes. Okay, when men are brought together, they no longer decide by chance and independently of each other, but they react upon one another. Many causes come into action, they trouble the man and draw them this way and that, but there is one thing they cannot destroy. The habits they have of Panurgi's sheep. So the sheep of Panurgi is a, a, a French tale of Rabelais in the 16th century, and they end up all jumping into the sea. This is the, so the obvious herding behavior. And he says, this hurting behavior, this is the thing which is preserved. This is one thing which we don't get away and which we uh, find all the time. So I think it's a very nice and beautiful warning that at least to extreme events like all jumping into the water, uh, one should be very careful to apply probability. Well, at least Poincaré had a very outspoken opinion to this. So, now let's go to the, to the uh, more recent developments. As we all know, uh, the uh, Bachelier's model was slightly modified by Paul Samuelson, who, because he got a postcard by Jim Savage, uh, who knows the work of Bachelier? Jim Savage was, was looking for a book of Bachelier, not for his thesis, and Paul Samuelson looked at MIT in the library, didn't find, went to Harvard, looked in the library, and there was this thesis, and he took it, and with his high school French, he somehow deciphered what this guy was doing, which was completely forgotten, at least among uh, economists, it had no uh, influence, and immediately was fascinated, and among other things, he wrote up the, the multiplicative uh, version of it. Well, you may allow uh, for a drift, but as we all know, this eventually is, is independent. So, this was natural because the, the, uh, the, there was not any more the natural scale of 100 francs, but it's, it's not a big deal, the, 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 the multiplicative or the additive version. With Josef Teichmann, we once uh, calculated for the original data of Bachelier, what is the difference when you calculate option prices uh, with, the, with the additive model or with the, with the Black-Scholes model. Uh, we wrote a small paper in mathematical finance about this, and it is of the order of 10 to the minus 8 of the underlying, or 10 to the minus 6 of the option pricing. So, so this one is tempted to call this completely negligible a priori, as uh, uh, Bachelier called it, because he, yeah, he addresses even in his thesis uh, that uh, in his model that uh, stock prices may become negative, but he dismisses it with completely negligible a priori. It's the same thing if for, for, the, for the height of a person or for the size of a shoe, so we have no problem of taking a normal distribution in statistics. 
also a negative height of a human being is at least as uh, absurd as a negative value for a, for a stock. Okay, but uh, let us come to the heart of the matter. Uh, now, no arbitrage. This is the important uh, new ingredient in Black Scholes, and uh, in a famous footnote of their, pap their paper, they attribute this insight to Robert Merton. Uh, okay, this is now the relation with the no arbitrage principle that uh, in the model, in their model or in Bachelier's model, uh, this uh, Bachelier's method is the only price which does not uh, give arbitrage possibilities. And let me just mention this fundamental theorem of asset pricing. This is in the, in the years after uh, the, uh, the paper by, by Black and Scholes and by Merton. Uh, these three authors in various combinations in three important papers uh, around this time uh, made it clear that no arbitrage is essentially the same as the existence of a martingale measure for the price process S. And as Frank has mentioned with Freddy Delban, uh, we, in a general mathematical context, we got rid of the word essentially and made a uh, precise mathematical theorem out of that. The, yeah, I should mention here, this is really the, the influence in the other way around is also important. I mean, uh, these, these questions coming from finance, they triggered quite a, a development within mathematics and made some uh, progress in, the, uh, in stochastic processes, which, which got applications also uh, outside of... Uh, uh, of the applications in finance. Okay, but let us come back to, uh, to this dynamic trading and no arbitrage principle. I, as I mentioned, this was uh, beyond the scope of uh, Bachelier, and this led to the uh, uh, notions of complete markets. We have perfect uh, replication. Then there was this theory of dynamic portfolio insurance. I mean, to insure, to protect your portfolio, you can buy a put option. Of course, this always was possible. But now people told you, you don't have to buy a put option. You can replicate it. And here is the trading strategy. And they put it on the computer, etc. And this uh, was one of, the, one of the main reasons of uh, the crash in 1987 when the Dow Jones went down by 22% or something like this within one day, when implicit volatility shot up to 150%, which was even double as much as in uh, 2008. And this was already the perfect uh, illustration of what Poincaré had predicted when people, when the sheep are somehow in a joint movement, then uh, the laws of probability uh, do not apply very well anymore. But this is not what uh, Bachelier or originally wanted. I mean, he was not uh, doing his uh, theory for, uh, for these extreme events. But I'll come back to this in a moment. Let me, yeah, at this stage, I should discuss a little bit on uh, the role of volatility. Of course, as we know from Black Scholes, and exactly in the same way with Bachelier, everything hinges on the sigma, which is assumed as a constant. And as Bachelier already notices, of course, it's not constant. Uh, even the name indicates that it is not uh, uh, constant, but changes according to the nervousness of the market. And how do we deal with this? Okay, now the first thing was noted already in one of the early papers uh, by Robert Merton. It's uh, that sigma is constant is not the essential thing. The essential thing is that it's deterministic. Okay, or the only thing which really matters is the accumulated volatility from time zero to time t, if this is a real number and not random, then exactly the same theory applies. You really have nothing to change. You just make a change of coordinates, and uh, uh, that's it. 
So uh, mathematically speaking, this is rather obvious, but conceptually it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. So what you really have to, to predict is, is, is not the, 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 the instant volatility, but how much volatility will be accumulated from today until the expiration of the uh, volatility. And now we go one step further. There was, again, mathematically it's not uh, very difficult. Uh, in fact, this uh, volatility sigma, it may not only depend on T, it can just as well depend on S, as long as this is in a deterministic way, nothing changes. You can, okay, you don't, can, cannot write up a formula, but you can easily calculate it. So conceptually, nothing new is happening. So, but while it, well, does this make sense economically to, uh, uh, to model the, the volatility as a deterministic function of time? Let's start here. Uh, well, as a deterministic function of time, does it make sense tomorrow the volatility will be 20% and in a week it will be 30%? It does not make much sense. But uh, uh, down here, this makes even less sense uh, to say, well, if T is such and S is such, the volatility is 25%, uh, etc. So, uh, but why was this invented? Because, as was noted, uh, very soon, this, uh, the volatility, I mean, it's not even consistent uh, at, at the same uh, moment of time and with the same expiration, you have this, most of you uh, will know, you have this smile and skew effects. So you have, if the, uh, the strike price is uh, far away from the actual price, then the implicit volatility is higher. And as this curve is like this, this is sometimes called the smile effect. And uh, uh, so how to cope with this? Uh, conceptually, it is quite clear because uh, the, when, you, when you are away from today's price, then the extreme events play a, higher, uh, a, a stronger role. And of course, the extreme events are grossly underestimated by uh, the normal distribution. So by putting here for an S, which is away from the present price, a higher value, you can somehow ac accommodate for this. And what Dupier, uh, what, he, what he designed is, well, you look at all the prices of so-called plain vanilla options, so just European options, uh, <coughs> with uh, different uh, uh, terms of expiration and strike prices. These you take as a given, and then you calculate the implicit volatility. Okay, this gives you a curve. And uh, uh, with this local volatility, you may calculate not the original option prices because they are the input anyhow. You don't have to recalculate them again, but you can use it to calculate exotic options like uh, barrier options or uh, you, you, you just name it path dependent options which are more complicated. Now, this is, uh, this is a nice uh, way of handling with this, but we are losing all economic insight. I mean, this is an abstract function which you get out of calibrating things to uh, given option prices without any good economic interpretation. And of course, it's wonderful. It's from a numerical point of view. This is a nice exercise from given, this is an inverse problem, etc. And it's quite hard to implement this on the computer. And then you get out some numbers for exotic options and everybody is happy. It uh, reminds me a little bit on a story of Tucholsky. And Tucholsky once said that the, the problem with the politicians is uh, at night they sit together with the journalists and when they're talking to them, they are lying to them. And when they read it next day in the newspapers, they start to believe it themselves. <laughs> the, uh, in a way, uh, you, you, you start with a model knowing very well uh, that there are little reasons why uh, such a thing should exist, etc. Or why should you, I mean, this heavily 
uh, results on the hypothesis that we have a diffusion, so uh, a process with continuous paths. Uh, and, but then you, you turn the computer, it says that some numbers come out, and of course they must be correct. Okay, this is the point where financial engineering starts and where we deviate uh, somewhat dangerously from the situation of Black Scholes or Bachelier where there is a clear insight into uh, what is going on. So, uh, uh, volatility, the mathematically satisfying way to cope with volatility is to say, of course, well, volatility itself is stochastic. So it may go up, it may go down, etc. Let's put it, model it as a stochastic process. But the problem is all the beauties of, uh, uh, of the Black-Scholes theory, or almost all the beauties, are gone. The il this illusion of replication, this is how Nisim Taleb calls it, uh, uh, this bursts. We don't have complete markets anymore. Uh, well, I'm a little bit oversimplifying, but uh, essentially, uh, once you pass to stochastic volatility, you have an incomplete market. So you may still calculate intervals of arbitrage, free prices, super sub replication, but you don't get uh, unique prices anymore. The nice thing was that this was independent of any economic arguments. You just had to prefer more to less. But all of a sudden, we are back to economics. We have to use uh, utility functions, uh, pricing by marginal utility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But practitioners don't like this so very much. And let me go yet one step further, as this is a meeting on robust finance. There has been recently uh, quite uh, some development on robust finance. And by robust finance, I mean, in this context here, model-free uh, finance. So you don't assume any model. The only thing which you assume, no arbitrage. This is uh, quite harmless to uh, assume no arbitrage. And from no arbitrage, what we know is that the stochastic model for stock prices, they should be a martingale under the pricing measure, but nothing more. And can we make uh, non-trivial uh, conclusions from this? And the answer is yes, but only in some very special cases. Well, we can always draw conclusions, but uh, that they are relevant in some special cases. Uh, but there is nice mathematics involved, and it is of some economic relevance. And I want to show this to you. This is now a little mathematics, which I have put in, but it's, it's elementary. Uh, so this is in a recent paper uh, with some colleagues uh, from uh, Vienna. So, Dupes inequality. Uh, let me, if ST is uh, a martingale, then we compare the terminal value of the, uh, of the martingale with the terminal value of the so-called maximal function, or we take the supremum. And the, let me give the uh, financial interpretation. So, Frank, what is your favorite stock? Uh, Mercedes. Mercedes, okay, Daimler, Daimler, okay, okay. So I promise to uh, pay you this ST bar, where T is, say, in a year from now, and we look from today until in a year, we take the highest price where Daimler was, and I pay you the square of it, okay? And <clears throat> so I'm afraid, and the situation which we do here, we know, however, the European options, we have options on the uh, uh, stock of Daimler in a year from now. These are these functions, but we can combine them and essentially every function we can, we can take. So we have on the market, we have a, 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 a derivative security which pays us the price of Daimler at time t and the square of it. But of course, I am shivering to my bones. 
net we will have here is t. Here is zero. This is Daimler. Then it will go up, and then it will go down, the st. And I hope you see a little bit. This is, this is what I'm really afraid. Then I will have to pay you a lot, and I can hardly protect myself with these things. Because why do I want to protect myself? There is Dupes inequality, which tells you uh, that when you compare the payoff of the maximal function squared with the payoff of the terminal value, you have an inequality with a 4 in front. So buying four European options should, in average, like in the, uh, in the thinking of Poincaré, uh, uh, should protect me uh, against what I have to pay to Frank. OK, but this is just an expectation. Now comes robust finance. And we, what we observed here is I can protect myself, not in average, but in a pathwise way. And here is the, <coughs> the, the, the statement. We may find functions, which we call trading strategies, the HT. And the interpretation is how many of the Daimler stock I hold at time t, such that if I follow this HT and I do the trading on the Daimler stock with the ST, I combine it with four times the uh, square of the terminal value of st. Oops, there is a terrible uh, omission. Here is a bar. This thing, what we have here, this high value, is covered, but now for every part. And I mean it now for every. This is very important. It's not for almost all, because we don't have a probability. This is really path by path. Uh, uh, by the way, this is not very, well, it is such an elementary statement. It must have an elementary proof. It is easy uh, to prove this. And in fact, this is a nice way to have a proof for this dupe inequality, which is one of the pillars of stochastic analysis. Because when you take expectations here, and remember you should have here the S square, the, the very definition of a martingale tells you the expectation of this should cancel out. So when taking expectations, you come from here to here. OK, so the story about uh, robust finance, and this, uh, with this I wanted to give you one example, is you don't assume any model. The only thing you assume is that uh, you have a martingale, or even here you don't explicitly see anymore the martingale, but you can transform a martingale inequality into a pathwise inequality, and it tells me to translate it into mathematical finance, that I can perfectly cover myself with this dangerous contract which I have sold to Frank by buying four such uh, European derivatives and following this trading strategy. OK, now, yeah, let me mention where are these. This is, of course, a nice example. Well, these. These power options, in fact, they exist in reality, but of course uh, they have a somewhat uh, restricted uh, importance. But there are some uh, situations where this is of practical relevance. Let me mention the work of Peter Carr and Roger Lee. There it is volatility derivatives. You have volatility swaps, etc. There this uh, theory works very nice. Let me, uh, there are nice uh, results for hedging of barrier options. And yeah, I want to show you the law contract versus re real life volatility, which is related to this paper here. In fact, this is uh, uh, based on the insight of Neuberger. And yeah, I want to show you the, the idea in, by, that's the last mathematics I'm doing. Uh, by illustrating it with a, with a simple model. So our model is DS, the, the usual Black-Scholes model. But the volatility, we say we don't know anything. It's just any predictable process. We, we, we make no uh, assumptions on it. And we look on the logarithm. Well, let's uh, go down here. The logarithm at the time uh, to maturity ST. 
Now, if you say that's a strange thing to look at the logarithm, it's not so strange because in the Black-Scholes theory, you have everything in the exponent, and if you take the log, you get it down. So, if you, this is just Ito's formula, uh, if you do it, then you can just write it in this way, in the integral way. This is, the log is here a, a, a term with dt and a term with dst. <clears throat> now, if you take expectations, just as before, you get this line here, because the expectation of the integral on a martingale, uh, this goes away. So we know what is the price of this contract here. Namely, it's given by the accumulated, well, not quite the volatility, but it's more natural to sum up the square of the volatility. So this is the pricing formula. But even more interesting is this formula here, which is a pathwise formula. This formula makes sense for every trajectory that, and now you can interpret this as a hedging term. This is, you always invest into the stock one over ST. This means the same, I always invest one euro into the stock. And in this case, this thing here, which is the price, uh, together with this uh, uh, strategy, exactly replicates the log of st independently of what the sigma t was. So this is a nice insight, and I wanted to, uh, yeah, I should jump to conclusions. So, uh, uh, the, but I had to give some reference to robust finance. Yeah. Now, this was all quite successful so far, but now we come to a different range of applications. Let me recall this famous 415 report. Dennis Weatherstone, who was the CEO of GP Morgan at this time, in the aftermath of the, of the 1987 crash, he wanted to have one number and at 415. How much can we lose on our, and this is an important word here, trading portfolio by tomorrow's close, because we had all this, uh, uh, these models here, and what people came up, the famous value at risk, you just uh, calculate the quantile, and I think this was a wonderful answer, but it was, this was an internal analytical in instrument. This is what it was uh, invented for, and it was not a number which is reported to the authorities, and where, as we have heard today, where then there is the optimization of, uh, how was this, uh, of uh, uh, the risk weighting, etc. Of course, if you elaborate on this, you can bring it down. Or as was noticed by Delban, Arzner, Eber, and Heath, it has, it has no good properties for the, the, the uh, uh, purposes of expected uh, uh, for, for uh, <coughs> Uh, risk uh, for risk management and uh, yeah so this is uh, I think a very good example uh, there is a tool which worked very well in a certain situation and it was so successful uh, and people now use it for things where it is not so successful let me here give briefly uh, some more applications beyond option pricing well uh, a longer story is a model for the term structure of interest rates. Well, this is, uh, this is a very nice way of uh, giving a coherent uh, structure to the world of bonds, which has different times of maturity, etc., which still builds on a good insight. And <clears throat> but uh, starting from this, there were... Uh, uh, a lot of mathematics was involved in credit risk, as we heard today. The more sophisticated mathematics was in this uh, uh, mortgage uh, securitization. But all this is not based on, uh, on sound uh, economic uh, uh, ideas. I mean, the, the famous uh, uh, example is this Gauss copula, which was uh, designed for the CDOs. So to, to uh, model the dependence of 1,000 or 2,000 uh, uh, credits. And the Gauss copula, the only advantage it has, it is uh, easy to, to calculate with, but is so obviously wrong to 
uh, model something, and in particular, this credit risk where you don't have the same situation of data. I mean, in stock prices, etc., you have huge data, you understand very well how market prices evolve. This was designed for things uh, which uh, <clears throat> did not have this basis. So I have to jump to conclusions. Lessons to be drawn. When applying mathematical methods in finance, make sure you understand the model. This is why I'm, I, I'm not so much, uh, I'm not blaming Black Scholes or something. In Black Scholes, of course, it is the art to plug in the, 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 the correct uh, 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 volatility. And, but people have a feeling, they understand what it is. And if they are good, they also know you should not apply it to extreme events. You should not apply it to risk management. Take Poincaré seriously. Uh, this was very nicely described by a CFO of a large Austrian bank who told me, this Black show theory, that's wonderful. I mean, it, it works so accurately in 99.5% in of, of the cases except for the one or two days per year which really matter. The, it, but it's clear, the, 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 there's the obvious mistake that uh, it models the, the tails in the wrong way, or whether in, in principle you can uh, 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 make good sense of herding behavior by probabilistic methods. So this should lead to some modesty, and in particular, when it comes to legal and accounting issues, keep it simple, keep the mathematics simple. I mean, the, uh, this, uh, what, what we were uh, told in, in, in Martin Helwig's talk, this uh, optimization of risk weighing, I mean, this is of course uh, obscene. And I am I, very much favoring to have easy rules, like uh, uh, just taking all the assets and not even starting with the risk weighing, or uh, to have conservative uh, uh, approaches for the uh, accounting issues for uh, how, to, how to count the assets. And I want to make a short uh, comparison with uh, uh, the insurance industry, the, in, in life insurance, say. The, uh, in the 19th century, uh, lots of uh, insurance companies went bankrupt for, for, for lots of reasons, but among among other things, there is the necessity to use some mathematics in life insurance because you have to calculate these reserves and you have to uh, <clears throat> put these reserves on the uh, right side of the balance sheet. But there, they have made the step, it's really simple. I mean, such a mortality table, which means the probabilities uh, uh, to die. This is something that every, everybody who is a little bit initiated can uh, uh, somehow appreciate and can say whether this is risky or not. Uh, the, the interest rate which you plug in, etc. These are things which are simple enough to be understood, maybe not by senior management, but at least by, uh, by the people who do it. And let me come to the conclusion. Mathematics is a wonderful tool in the analysis, among others, of finance. But remember Goodhart's law, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. I love this uh, phrase very much. When you just try to uh, make up the mathematics that they produce you some result, then you should not expect the mathematics to do something good for you. Thank you very much. Yes? Well, well I, I have time for some questions. So if not, thank you very much.